this is a course about alternatives, especially institutional alternatives for the organization of contemporary society. In a world that despairs of such alternatives. So at the outset, I think it is useful and fair that in just a few ways, in just a few words, I try to describe the, the attitude, the impulse with which I embark on this argument with you. For the last two or three hundred years, uh, the world has been set on fire by a revolutionary project. Uh, this project has two sides. One side is the political side, uh, expressed by the doctrines of democracy, liberalism, and socialism. Uh, the other side is the personalist side that has been carried by the romantic movement and especially by the worldwide popular romantic culture with its message that the ordinary man and woman is not so ordinary after all and shares in the attributes of the divine or of divinity. And in particular, in one attribute, the attribute of transcendence over the circumstance in which they find themselves. So this idea is intimately related to a conception of humanity, this romantic idea. The conception that there is always more in us, in each of us individually, and in all of us collectively, the human race, than there is or ever can be in the social and conceptual worlds that we build and inhabit. They are finite in relation to us. And we are infinite in relation to them. We are capable of more experience, of more invention, of more vision than they can countenance. Now this project, this revolutionary project that has shaken up the world in the last few centuries, remains the strongest project in the world. It has enemies, but all its enemies respond to it. It continues to command the agenda. However, it is now in the paradoxical position of being both strong and weak. It is strong because it remains despite all the commanding project, but it is weak because its defenders, its votaries, its champions no longer know what its steps should be, its next steps, either on the political side or on the personalist side. And the rule of the spirit is that we can preserve only what we renounce and reinvent. Now, my attitude, which will be manifest in all of our arguments here, is that my life happens to have fallen in a counter-revolutionary interlude in this long revolutionary period in the history of humanity. St. Augustine says that all ages are equidistant from eternity, but it matters what our place in history is. It, the, the distinctive character of our place presents us with a different circumstance. And I am determined that my ideas and attitudes will not be shaped 
by the biases of this counter-revolutionary interlude. I want this revolution to continue, but I understand that it cannot continue in the form and with the content that it had before. So that is the essential description of uh, the attitude that I bring to this argument about alternatives in the world, in a world that disbelieves in alternatives. Now this first class is an introductory class to give you a sense of the scope of the, of the project. And what I propose to do, at least in the initial part of the class, is to describe how I understand the points of departure of this argument. First, with respect to method, to the understanding of society and history. Uh, second, with regard to the ideal, to the normative direction that animates it. And third, with respect to its substance, the content of the programmatic agenda <coughs> <coughs> that I want to explore with you. Uh, all of these classes will be filmed and the video placed on the course website uh, a few days after each class. So there's no need to take copious notes unless you regard this note taking as useful to the organization of your own ideas. Uh, my basic practice in the course is simple. I will try to develop a position as forcefully as I can. Uh, I will not wait for a position to uh, arise as it were inductively or spontaneously from our class discussion because I understand that we live in a climate of far-reaching skepticism about such projects. <coughs> but uh, I do want and expect and demand your active engagement. So I'll stop very often and expect you to, to engage, to resist, to propose alternative lines of inquiry and the quality of our whole experience here in the course of the semester depends on that disposition for engagement. Now, let me begin with the methodological point of departure. <coughs> the way of imagining alternatives, especially institutional alternatives and discussing them uh, in our historical circumstance. So here is a familiar dilemma confronted by anyone anywhere in the world today who attempts to propose alternatives. If I propose something that's far away from what exists, you're likely to say, that's interesting or attractive, but it's utopian. And if I propose something that's close to what exists, you'll say, that's feasible, but it's trivial. And so, in the present climate of opinion, Almost anything that can be proposed or that will be proposed is likely to be dismissed <coughs> as either utopian or trivial. And this dilemma, this false dilemma, threatens to paralyze the programmatic imagination. Now, I want to argue that it is a false dilemma because it arises from a misunderstanding 
of the nature of a programmatic argument, an argument about alternatives. And more generally, uh, a, a misunderstanding of our relation to the established order. A programmatic argument is not or should not be about blueprints. It's about a direction. It's about a sequence from here to there, a succession of steps. And any programmatic argument worth considering can be explored at points relatively close to what exists or relatively far from what exists. So it's, it's not like architecture. It's like music. Uh, it's about a sequence. And the two most important attributes of a programmatic argument are, first, that it mark a direction. And our idea of the direction can change and will inevitably change as we go along. And that it select, in a particular historical context, the initial steps by which to begin to move in that direction. So it's the combination of the idea of the direction with the selection of the initial steps that defines a programmatic argument. And viewed in that way, then, the distinction between remote proposals far away from what exists and proximate proposals close to what exists is specious because the, these two sets of proposals can or should simply mark different points along the same trajectory. Now, this problem, this misunderstanding, is greatly aggravated by a salient feature of our intellectual history, the history of ideas about society and its transformation uh, in historical experience. The problem that aggravates this false dilemma is that we now have no usable way of talking about structural discontinuity, structural alternatives in history. The classical European social theory in particular, Marx's theory of society and history, which exercised the greatest influence on the left, or more generally on the progressives in modern history, had a view of structure and structural change. But this idea of structural change was surrounded and compromised by a series of illusions about the nature of structures and of structural alternatives. And one of these illusions is the view that the basic institutional and ideological regime is an indivisible system. a single package which changes all at once or all together or else not at all. So for example, in, in Marxist social theory, there's the idea of successive modes of production, the slave economy, feudalism, capitalism, socialism. Each of them is an indivisible system. The corollary of this idea that there are these systems in history 
is a dual idea of politics. There are basically, on this view, two kinds of politics. There is the revolutionary substitution of one of these indivisible systems for another. Or there is the reformist management of one of these systems. Those are basically the two kinds of politics. Now, I believe that this idea is entirely false. There aren't these systems. There are indeed structures. They exercise far-reaching influence. They are recalcitrant to change. But they are not indivisible systems. And the characteristic way in which they change is that they change piecemeal. <coughs> So now there are many people in the world, especially among the progressives or in the left, who have ceased to believe in the assumptions of these classical social theories, but still cling to the vocabulary or to the attitudes, to the implications. So take the idea of revolution, of revolutionary substitution. What is its primary function in the contemporary progressive discourse? Its primary role is to serve as an alibi for its opposite. So many countries in the world are now governed by disenchanted ex-Marxists who have become institutionally conservative social liberals or social democrats. And what they think is the following. Real change, fundamental change, would be systemic change. It would be the substitution of one of these systems, capitalism, for another, socialism. Well, that kind of change is not in the cards. And if it were in the cards, it would be too dangerous. So what's left to do? What's left to do is to humanize the existing order. And so in this way, the idea of revolution is turned into its opposite and used to justify a merely humanizing orientation to the present order in the world. So these theoretical assumptions matter. And they shape our imagination of the possibilities in history. The classical social theories had an idea of structure and structural change, but compromised by a series of deterministic assumptions, such as the one that I've just evoked. On the other hand, what happens in the contemporary social sciences and the contemporary policy discourse. On the whole, it escapes these deterministic illusions, but only because it abandons the idea of structural alternatives altogether. And the result is that a great deal of contemporary social science and policy discourse amounts to what, in the history of philosophy, we would label right-wing Hegelianism. The real is rational. It's like a retrospective rationalization of the established arrangements. And not a source of insight. All insight in every field of inquiry, including natural science, depends on the relation between the understanding of what exists, the actual, and the imagination of what could exist, of how that actual could be transformed in the realm of the adjacent possible. To understand a phenomenon or a state of affairs, 
is to understand what it can become. If we have no view of what it can become, then we don't understand it at all. And we are misrepresenting our view of it as an understanding and explanation, when in fact it is just a retrospective mystification. <coughs> so each social science breaks this vital connection between insight into the actual and imagination of the possible in a different way. It's like Tolstoy's remark at the beginning of Anna Karenina that all happy families are alike, but each unhappy family is unhappy in a different way. Each of the social sciences breaks this vital connection in a distinct way. The consequence of this intellectual background that we are programmatically aphasic and disoriented, as we have no way of talking about structural change, is that we fall back on a fake criterion of political realism, which is that something is realistic, a proposal is realistic, to the extent that it approximates what already exists. And it's unrealistic if it's far from what exists. Well, that's just a, an acknowledgment of intellectual bankruptcy. It's not an understanding of anything. Well, that's our situation. And that helps explain why in our situation today we find it so hard to think, to argue, and to imagine programmatically to imagine about alternatives. And so this is a struggle that will accompany us throughout all of these discussions. And that then is the first part, <coughs> point of departure, the attempt to develop a way of thinking about alternatives and about structural alternatives without acquiescing in the deterministic assumptions of the classical social theory. Now let me stop there in this first description of the point of departure and ask whether someone would like to make a comment or uh, raise a question. Yes? Um, so in the first meeting that was Speak more loudly, so please. In the first meeting that was assigned for today, you say that there are four conditions that are not met for structural change in the left. And the fourth one was a lack of crisis. And I was wondering if you consider global climate change or massive inequality in the US one of those sites of crisis that the left could build upon. Well, it's interesting. Uh, so the kind of crisis that served as the circumstance of change, the main kind of crisis in the rich North Atlantic countries was war. So crisis in the form of the two world wars of the 20th century was the main enabling circumstance of transformation. And it's not clear that climate change has that dimension because it's argued to have these consequences, but it's nothing with the immediacy and catastrophic nature of war felt right now, not as the prospect of some future evil. Um, but the extent to which crisis is a condition of change is, of course, a variable and not a constant in history. So the organization of society in general, and in particular the organization of politics, of democratic politics, might shape the extent to which change depends on crisis. 
So, for example, take the American Constitution, which is the object of a cult in the United States, is treated as sacrosanct and even part of the national identity. Uh, there are two generative principles of organization in the American Constitution. There's a liberal principle of the fragmentation of power, and there is a conservative principle of the slowing down of politics, expressed in Madison's scheme of checks and balances. And on the whole, the Americans, not just the American people as as a whole, but the jurists, the specialists, believe that the liberal principle and the conservative principle are indissolubly connected. I think they're mistaken. And they're not naturally and necessarily connected. They're connected by design or intention because part of the aim of the authors of the American Constitution was to inhibit the use of politics to transform the basic regime of society. And there are any number of constitutional mechanisms that might reaffirm the liberal principle but repudiate the conservative one. So it's a matter of design. That's an example of an institutional argument. And it's also an example of a kind of argument that, for the most part, doesn't appear in contemporary politics. Most of the discourse is about everything except structure and structural alternatives. Yes? So why do you think we are in this period of counter-revolution, as you said, in which our kind of institutional imagination has been lulled to sleep? Has, it, has something similar happened before? Well, it's, let, me, let me begin with your last statement. It's not as if this incendiary impulse were the normal. It's not the normal, uh, except in the last two or 300 years, where the world has been set on fire, as I said. So there were these revolutionary ideologies in the 20th century. Their history was bound up with the history of these great wars. And they are widely regarded as having led to a series of calamities. Uh, so we've stepped back from this idea of these revolutionary changes. And one of the counterparts to this abdication of structural ambition in politics is what you could loosely describe as the privatization of the sublime. So where we think about alternatives is in art, in religion, in our personal experience. And all of this retreats into the innermost recesses of personal experience of the heart, walled off from the public world, which is supposed to be the reign of coal deficiencies and equities. So to give an adequate history of this transformation would be to explain everything in the modern world, because Every feature of the evolution of society and politics and culture is bound up in this momentous change. Now, my view, which is implicit in the remark that I made about programmatic argument, is that real structural change in the world is almost invariably piecemeal and fragmentary, but can nevertheless become revolutionary in outcome if it persists in a certain direction. So this idea of wholesale 
systemic transformation is largely an illusion, a fantasy. And a fantasy which, as I argued before, largely serves to defend its opposite, resignation. So we, 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 we make this association that gradual, fragmentary, piecemeal change is superficial, and fundamental change is wholesale and instantaneous. It's, it's false. And, uh, and this falsehood has dramatic practical consequences. Yes. Where, where, and when? The Iran under Mossadegh, yeah. Congo under Lula, uh -huh. but because they challenged, in effect, because they were put into a category by the United States and labeled communist, they, their possibilities were crushed. So to what extent do we <coughs> outside of a hegemonic world in which outside actors put movements Well, hegemony is a, is a very loaded word yeah. with a long history, so it's, What's the dominant point of view? That's one way of interpreting the concept of hegemony. As it was used in the left by thinkers like Antonio Gramsci, hegemony refers to a dominant set of beliefs or of consciousness. And uh, so there's something very important there to my mind. Maybe this was part of what you were signaling. That uh, a powerful transformative practice has to involve some, some down payment on the promised future. In other words, there has to be a tangible in initiative or set of initiatives. But at the same time, that initiative has to be read through the prism of some general view of what's possible, they say. This is the foreshadowing of something greater. And that's really the method of the prophet. The prophet touches the wound, gives the example, points to something in contemporary experience, but then views that in the light of a larger vision. Can I reframe to you a little more precisely the question? You're saying that something could be revolutionary in outcome, just no, it just needs to persist. In its method, in yes. Its method. So yeah. what I'm getting at is how do we enable the persistence Well, that's a discussion because every because almost all real structural change is piecemeal, and every piecemeal change has this inherent ambiguity that it can be used as an excuse to not advance further, or it can be a step to the next step. So in political experience, the meaning of something depends on what comes after it. So it's the sequence that determines the meaning. And there is this built-in ambiguity. So then every partial change can be dismissed as shallow. But in the world, all we really have is partial change. So if we associate partial change with abdication, then we're giving up on the, on the cause of structural change. That's, that's part of this argument. Yes? I guess to build on what you were asking. Yes. One of the regions, uh, you mentioned that Latin America is one of the regions that has most kind of subjugated to the North Atlantic, let's say, institutional. There's most ideas. obedient, yes. And, and it has most obedient, that's the word. Yeah. And, um, it's also been the one that has really worsened its relative position to a in the world economy. Yes. But if we link it to this other question, we have examples such as Hakoa Bent in Guatemala, who was not yeah. allowed to move forward because uh, you know, the CIA took him out. Of course. So is, that, is that kind of what you were also asking about? Like, yeah. yeah. I mean, like maybe somebody comes along and they're not thinking this huge immediate system, change the system overnight, but they're piecemeal change proposals are viewed as such Correct. a threat. 
Correct. So there has to be there, there so heresy in the world has to be protected. And this is part of the discussion of what you might have been referring to with respect to hegemony. So heresy needs a shield. So the shield is economic and the shield is also military. So for example, take what I mean by the economic shield. Uh, when the progressives abandoned faith in Marxism, which they largely have in the world, even when they continue to use the Marxist vocabulary, they took refuge in vulgar Keynesianism. And one of the propositions of vulgar Keynesianism is that the level of saving in the country is more the consequence than the cause of economic growth. So don't worry about saving. Just use stimulus to manage the economy counter-cyclically. And then the rise in the saving level will be the consequence of this virtuous cycle. But this belief disregards the need to have a strategic buffer or shield at the beginning of a rebellious process of development, that a country may strike out on a strategy of economic growth that displeases the capital markets. And it needs to be able to displease them for quite a while in order to develop such a strategy. Uh, and therefore, it may need to force a raise in the level of saving and to subordinate or disregard the attractions of this Keynesian countercyclical <coughs> management of the economy. That's an example of the economic <coughs> shield of heresy. And of course, there's the military shield. So I'm a Brazilian. And my country is the most pacific, the least warlike of the large countries in the world. We have no wars. We, our last war, real war, was in the, the middle of the 19th century. Uh, and so it's not clear why we should defend ourselves. But one reason why we should defend ourselves is to be able to say no. And because we don't want to live in a world in which only the meek are unarmed and the belligerent are armed to the teeth. And that's not good for us or good for humanity. So these are two examples on the economic side and on the military side of the imperative of creating the shield of heresy. Latin America, as you mentioned, has been the most obedient part of the world in the last few decades and the one that has suffered the greatest decline because the lesson of historical experience is that rebellion is not always rewarded, but obedience is invariably punished. And uh, so this is also part of the discussion. Yes. Um, when you say that disobedience is also sort of punished, like Cuba, the embargo. Uh, of course, um, of course, it's risky. Uh, always disobedience. Uh, so it doesn't. As I said, rebellion is not always rewarded, and it's, it's dangerous. Uh, everything is dangerous. And this is a theme which will accompany us in our discussions. The philosopher Alfred North Whitehead said, the business of the future is to be dangerous. So if we're not determinists, we believe that everything is dangerous. This is a very interesting sideline <coughs> of deterministic social theories like, like Marxism. 
because one of the many ways of understanding their function is that they were an effort to arouse the heroic will against overwhelming odds. So there are overwhelming odds against transformation, but we could say history is on our side. But the, the, the cost is very high, because the cost <coughs> is illusion. And illusion has practical consequences. So somehow we should be able, in our transformative efforts, to dispense with the support of these illusions. Now let me say something else that it directly relates to this dilemma that I presented at the outset about programmatic argument, the utopian versus the trivial. So the way to understand a programmatic argument or a sequence of transformation is to think of it as a succession of steps uh, that can be explored close to what exists or far away from what exists. Now here, in the academic setting, I will tend to emphasize the middle position of these successions. That is something that's neither alternatives described at a point which is neither very close nor very far away. And the reason is that this middle position tends to be most useful for the purposes of clarification. It has a scholastic advantage. But there's a problem in this preference, which is accepted for the sake of clarity. The problem is that the middle positions in the spectrum tend to be too far away from what exists to seem realistic, but not far away enough to arouse enthusiasm. And that's why in the discourse of transformative politics, we disregard these middle steps of the spectrum and combine the very remote, which is the prophetic, with the very close. The discourse of transformative politics is or should be both practical and prophetic. But here in this context, our priority is understanding and the development of ideas. And that's the preference for these middle points of the spectrum. So you have to correct. And you have to understand that the same kind of arguments or ideas could be pursued closer and further away in this spirit of combining the prophetic and the practical. But here we have a problem. So we're not in politics here. We're far away from the immediate scene of action. So let's have the advantages of our disadvantages. And the advantage is the advantage of the luxury of clarification. And that's then the, that's then the emphasis that I want to give. Now let me then, did you, was there someone else? Yes. Um, so a lot of the structural change you mentioned, Bill, is to an end towards an objective. So is there clarity among the progressives of what they intend to achieve? Yes, of course. So that is exactly the next point, the next point of departure, the normative point of departure, because the first was just the problem of method, of thinking about structure. And th insist, thinking about structure in this situation in which the social sciences that are around us are more part of the problem than they are part of the solution. So we can all say, well, we need to develop these alternatives. We need, we need an economics, but not the economics that exists, another economics that doesn't exist and so forth with political science and sociology. And so 
we need this alternative understanding and we don't have it. So that's part of the problem. And so as we go along, we have to generate the ideas necessary to our task. Now then we come to this question of the normative direction. And once again, I want to say just a few words about this because like everything else in these initial remarks, these issues will come back to us many, many times in different forms. So here's the, what I understand to be the dominant conception of the ideological conflict that has existed in the world for a long time now. So it's a conflict between what you could call shallow equality and shallow freedom. So what's the division between the right and the left on this conventional view? The division is the right consists in those who prioritize freedom against the background of the established economic and political arrangements. And the left are those who prioritize equality against the background of those same political and economic arrangements. That's the dominant understanding of the ideological conflict. Now, I say shallow freedom against shallow equality because the term shallow is meant to connote the acceptance of the established institutional background. Now, what happens if we then begin to think that everything consequential in politics or in social transformation depends on change in the structure, which means change in the institutions, in the economic and political institutions, and in the ideological or conceptual assumptions associated with the institutional arrangements? That's a structure. So let's relax this constraint of, <coughs> of shallowness, the acceptance of the background structure. Well, how do we then think of what's left or what's progressive? Is it an equality of circumstance and outcome? achieved through a radical mechanism of redistribution. There's no economic accumulation. There's accumulation. We then <coughs> redistribute to assure the equality of circumstance. That would be deep equality. Now, it seems that no one is actually, actually wants deep equality understood in that way. It would all be like ancient Sparta. We would all be poor but equal. Who wants that? No one wants that. So it doesn't make sense as, a, as an alternative understanding of the left or of the progressives. The alternative proposal, which is disturbing and perplexing at the start, is that what would distinguish the left is that it wants deep freedom <coughs> as an ideal objective. And this actually is also an interpretation of what both the liberals and the socialists in the 19th century wanted. What they wanted, what they have always wanted, is a larger life for the ordinary man and woman with more scope, with more intensity, with more capability. We become bigger and we'll become bigger together. And the struggle against entrenched inequality is entirely accessory to that larger objective. Entrenched inequality is incompatible with that larger objective. 
But the objective is, is, is the shared greatness. The objective is not the equality per se. And what is the method? The method is structural change. So then on this alternative view, how would we understand the distinction between right and left? The right would consist in those who disbelieve in the possibility of this shared bigness. They think it's natural for human life to be little, at least for the great majority of people. And they don't believe in institutional alternatives. And the left, or the progressives, would be those who have this conception of shared bigness and believe that it is to be achieved by cumulative, albeit piecemeal, transformations of the structure. And then we get to a very different conception of the distinction between right and left. Now, actually, this very different conception is very close to the understanding of the division between right and left that existed before, before the second half of the 20th century. The distinction between the right and the left as it was understood by the classical liberals and socialists. Their idea of the objective was that the objective is this ascent of humanity to a higher form of life. Together, we become bigger together. And the method was structural change. Now, they had a very narrow view of bigness because it was framed on the model of the aristocratic ideal of self-possession. So the characteristic anxiety of liberal thinkers like John Stuart Mill or Tocqueville is that democracy would bring with it the transformation of whole peoples into nations of sheep, conformists. And they had this idea in relation to this aristocratic conception of, of self-possession. And for them, the idea of structural change was always dogmatic because each sect of the liberals or the socialists presented a formula, said, here's the system, here's the blueprint, follow the system and you'll be free. Now, we have good reason to have disbelieve in these blueprints and these systems, that there's a definitive institutional blueprint. And so if we attempt now, in our historical circumstance, to resurrect this older idea of the distinction between the right and the left, we have to have a more capacious conception of the shared bigness. And we can no longer accept the institutional dogmatism. So on that point, we confront a problem without historical precedent, which is how to give primacy to structural alternatives without succumbing to a structural dogmatism. We don't know how. Uh, and uh, one of the practical consequences is that we would want the institutions, the institutional alternatives, economic and political, to have among their attributes the attribute of organizing our experimentation, of facilitating and arranging their own transformation in the light of experience. So we discover the way along the way. We have a sense of the direction but our sense of the direction keeps being refined or adjusted. Uh, 
and we are committed to no institutional dogmas. And on that basis, then we get a different conception of the relation between the right and the left. Now, on that conception, at least in the advanced societies and the rich <coughs> countries of the North Atlantic world, almost all of the political forces, including the ones that regard themselves as progressive, are in fact conservative. Because what's generally the situation of the left in the world? And especially in the rich North Atlantic world, the situation is that it has no project. Its project is the project of its conservative adversaries with a humanizing discount. So its, its main impulse is pietistic rather than transformative. What is its project? Its project is the project of, of its conservative adversaries but with a human face, with less injustice, with more kindness, with more inclusion, and so forth. And what would be the alternative to that? The alternative would be this, this black box of, and this fantasy of revolution, of systemic change. Now, of course, uh, this conception of the ideal, in response to your provocation there, uh, is not innocent of assumptions about who we are and can and should become, philosophical or religious or spiritual assumptions. Uh, let's begin with a central point in liberal political theory. The central point is the idea that visions of the good <coughs> are always sectarian. The institutional organization of society embodied in the law should be an impersonal scheme of right that is neutral with respect to conflicting visions of the good. That's one of the most central points of classical liberal political theory. Now, I would want to argue that the institutional order, the order of right embodied in the law, can never be neutral. There is no such neutrality. Any set of institutional arrangements tilts the scales in favor of some forms of experience and against others. The idea of neutrality is an illusion and a dangerous illusion. It's a dangerous illusion because it's always in the service of its opposite. That is to say, when you claim neutrality for an order, you are in fact entrenching the order against attack and revision. And the order always has this partial character. Nevertheless, the illusory idea of neutrality has a kinship, an analogical relation, to a goal that is not only legitimate, but indispensable. <laughs> and so the institutional order on this other view cannot be neutral, but it can be Catholic, open, to a large range of experience and contradiction. And it can be corrigible if the institutions are, are not insulated against challenge and change, but organize and facilitate their own revision. So on this view, Catholicity, contradiction, corrigibility, are the real life counterparts, the legitimate counterparts, to this illegitimate and illusory goal of neutrality. It's a different, it's a different conception. Now, furthermore, I would want to say that underlying this other view of the distinction between the right and the left, 
is a conception of humanity, of who we are. And I should make it explicit right at the outset, because it too is not a dogma, it's, but it, it, it should be visible. So the conception is that among our most important attributes is the attribute of transcendence I mentioned before. There is always more in us than there is in the social and conceptual worlds that we build and inhabit. And so this is the divine attribute of transcendence. We cannot aspire to omnipotence or omniscience, but we can increase our quota in this attribute of transcendence. And in that sense, we become more human by becoming more godlike. And there are two sets of contradictions in our progress towards self-possession. One regards the relationship between the self and others. So to be free, to be bigger, to come into the possession of life in, in time, we have to connect with other people. But every connection threatens us with subjugation, with some loss of distinction and freedom. And this is a contradiction in the conditions of self-assertion. How then do we become free? To become free, we must be able to connect without being subjugated. We have an experience of that in the sphere of intimacy, in personal love. But outside the sphere of intimacy, the, the path to this form of connection that doesn't subjugate is the cooperation of free and equal individuals. But it has no determined in institutional form. So what organization of the economy? What organization of politics? It's related to that idea of humanity. Now, there's a second contradiction, which has to do with the relation between the agent and his social world, not between the person and particular other people. To be free, we have to be able to engage in a real world. No one is free in isolation. But every engagement in a real world threatens to exact as the price of engagement that we surrender to that world, that we become its puppets. So how could we ever be free and bigger? We would have to be able to engage without surrendering. To diminish the price of surrender that our engagement demands from us. And therefore, to establish arrangements in society that allow us to engage without surrendering, so that we can become somehow both insiders and outsiders. And then we'll be free. So, and once again, then we would need the institutions to allow us to rebel, to allow us to challenge them and change them. And that's also part of this conception of deeper freedom. So those are some of the ideas that then are the normative background to this argument and that begin to give substance to this conception of a shared bigness. We'll ascend, but we'll ascend together. Uh, and uh, that then is, is, becomes a central part of this, of this idea of the distinction between, between the right and the left. Now, again, let me stop there and ask for your comments. Uh, they all regard this prophetic element in, in a political vision. Yes? Uh, I remember it in the book you mentioned um, there was a problem with what, what is the agent or the constituency of the left. Yes. Because these boundaries of the proletariat are now diffused and also yes. it's very difficult to think of an agent yes. state that is right. Yes. So uh, 
but what it wasn't clear to me is why should be the new agent of all yes. these social change? Allow me to postpone that because that's another discussion that we'll come to very soon. But now the focus is on this normative orientation. Now, of course, the normative orientation that I just described is intimately related to this revolution that I mentioned right at the beginning of the class. It's this revolutionary project that, that put the world on fire with its political side, its personalist side. It's that idea. It's the idea that we, that we, that we rise. And uh, we, we, become, we become more godlike. Uh, and we do so through this change in the practical organization of society. Yes. Um, speaking to, <clears throat> pardon me. Speaking to sort of the fallacy of neutrality. Yeah. Um, oftentimes, I find frequently those on the left are very frustrated with the compromise that we're seeing from our liberal fellows, and so I sort of wonder if you could speak to the difference between compromise and piecemeal change. Well, there's no necessary difference. I don't take compromise as a bad word uh, because there's no activity in the world without compromise. Uh, so is, isn't that true, that we then have to distinguish the compromises that are simple abdications, resignations, from the compromise that opens the path for the next step? There's a great deal of confusion in the contemporary debates because the first of all, the objective is not clear, right? So what prevails is this idea of shallow equality in the, in the doctrines of the left and of the progressives. And that's then combined with acquiescence in the established institutional arrangements. So take the theories of justice that are most influential in the Anglo-American world. Theories of justice like the Rawlsian theory of justice. On the surface, they seem to be radically egalitarian only admit that degree of inequality that suits the interests of the least advantage and so forth. If equality was the supreme objective, equality was never the supreme objective before. It was a subordinate objective. But then that profession of egalitarian faith is combined with the institutional conservatism or agnosticism. It's the market economy, more or less, as it's organized now. The market economy is a huge instrument for the creation of wealth. Unfortunately, it generates inequality. So then we correct the inequality after the fact through retrospective tax and transfer by progressive taxation and redistributive social spending. Now, we all know or should know in experience that Fundamental inequalities cannot be effectively corrected by retrospective redistribution because we then establish a contradiction between the logic of economic arrangements and assumptions and this redistributive impulse. To make a major advance in equality, we would have to innovate in the arrangements that define the initial distribution of economic advantage, rather than having to correct the inequality after the fact through these compensatory measures. But what are these theories of justice? It's like in their real historical circumstance, their function is to offer a kind of pseudo-philosophical gloss on the homely practices of compensatory redistribution under institutionally conservative social democracy. 
That's, that's what they really are. So on the surface, it seems to be very radical, this primacy according to egalitarianism. But when you add up the profession of egalitarian faith and the institutional conservatism or agnosticism, the pragmatic residue is just this justification of compensatory redistribution by tax and transfer. That's what comes out of this machine. And so it's, it seems very abstract, but it's like a philosophical sideshow to the social democratic or social liberal settlement of the middle of the 20th century. And it then deflects us from the task, from this task of structural reimagination. Uh, so, we, so we now have these two points of departure that already present a very tall order because we need a method of thinking about structural alternatives, which the contemporary social sciences don't provide, although they're all useful in, in little pieces. And we, uh, and we have a conception of the objective which is very far away from this contemporary conservative egalitarianism or pseudo-egalitarianism, which serves as the ideology of the, of the, of the social democrats. And then this explains what the situation is, that there's, there's no project. What's the project? The project is the project of the conservatives. So, and with this humanizing face. And from the standpoint of practical politics, of real conflict in these societies, this has a huge disadvantage. Because the truth seems to be in, in political struggle that whatever force most credibly represents the cause of innovation of construction, of energy, of the creation of the new, commands the agenda in politics. And then the, the, the left then, if it resigns itself to sugarcoating, to humanizing this project of the conservative adversaries, is in a losing position from the outset. So if we have to have a different view of the creation of the new, of productive energy. Now, translate that abstraction into a concrete feature of the debate in political economies. On the whole, in many of these societies, the left, the progressives, have no productivist project. They have no project for the supply side of the economy. There's no progressive approach to the supply side of the economy. Uh, they just have a project for the demand side of the economy, for consumption, for the equalization of circumstances after the market has operated. And the only alternative to that position seems to be this jump into the darkness, into the abyss of revolution, the substitution of capitalism by socialism, and so forth. That's a description of the situation that we find. And then there, there are no projects or few projects. And the leftists are even afraid of formulating a project because of the divisions and fears that would arouse. So their characteristic situation is to pretend to conceal, for tactical reasons, a plan that they, in fact, don't have. So that's what we have. And you can't, you can't have a plan in politics unless you have it collectively through some debate. It can't exist as a secret or as some kind of secret intention. Uh, but that's, that's the situation that we find in the world.
Now, shall I go ahead to the third point of departure? That's about the substance. Yes. Uh, I guess I just wanted to ask about what I see as sort of like a... a Speak a little more yeah. loudly. So Sorry, people in the back like a, a chicken and egg problem between sort of humanist and structuralist perspectives. Yes. I think uh, you see, you know, maybe what seem like two opposing perspectives, like one of which is that structural change will never be completely possible or be possible in a meaningful way without sort of changing the, the normative goals that individuals themselves hold, or alternatively, that, um, you know, uh, developing uh, humanist tendencies will never be possible without structural change. And it, it seems like there's sort of a, a tension between the perspectives there, and I was wondering where um, what your between between now between which and which perspective be, between like uh, you know like whether uh, developing a sort of humanism is a, a prerequisite for structural change, or alternatively, structural change is a prerequisite for um, you know actually achieving human well on the well if we if we translate this into a the question about quality human a large part of the what we're calling the humanizing effort is the effort to attenuate the inequalities generated in the market that's a lot, that's part of the context I, I do think, I think when I'm saying humanist, though, I'm talking more about the sort of transcendentalist, like a humanist perspective. But isn't it embodied in these practical things? So the humanist would be, uh, so, so let me give you just a practical example of a theme which will be very important in the, in the programmatic arguments of the course. Um, there is now in the economies of all the major countries in the world a new advanced practice of production, which we call the knowledge economy, which is uh, intensive in technology and science, dedicated to permanent innovation, and characterized by a whole new set of practices of production. It replaces the previous vanguard of production, which was industrial mass production, sometimes called Fordist mass production, conventional industry. But this new vanguard is quarantined in a series of fringes in each part of the production system that exclude the vast majority of businesses and of workers. Now, it is remarkable that the dominant political forces in these societies, right of center, left of center, right and left wing populists also, seem to have no project for this transformation. So the new vanguard is insular, it's confined, it's quarantined. There's a deepening chasm between the advanced and backward parts of the production system. And that chasm becomes a driver of both economic stagnation and economic inequality. Now, what's the industrial policy of the right forces and left forces in these societies? seems that for the most part it's the same policy. They don't have any project for deepening and disseminating the knowledge economy, for overcoming this chasm between the advanced and backward parts of the production system. At most, they want to buy a few more years for declining mass production industry, like the so-called Rust Belt in the United States. So, constraints on plant closings, on subcontracting. Everyone knows that that's not going to work in the long term. That that's just a temporary accommodation. That's just playing for time. So uh, <coughs> what do they then propose? Instead of that, they propose more entitlements, more redistributive entitlements to 
attenuate the inequalities generated in the market. And to correct these inequalities that are anchored in the hierarchical segmentation of the production system, the, the redistributive social spending would have to be vast. And long before it reached the requisite dimension to make a big difference, it would begin to disorganize the economy, the established economic arrangements and incentives. So that's an example of the practical content of this contrast between the humanizing and the transformative. In there are many different contexts, but that's an example of one context. And so uh, there's no progressive approach to the supply side. There's no productivist project. And in the absence of a productive project, all there can be is an attempt to attenuate the unequalizing consequences of this insular character of the new vanguard. That's the kind of, that, that's the kind of practical anchor of this, of this contrast, if that's part of what you meant. Yeah, I, I think it gets to some of it, but I still think even like putting aside the humanizing character sort of within the transformative project, it seems like there's, can be sort of a, a difficulty in knowing where to start between the first pillar you mentioned before, the, you know, the pillar of structural change, and the second so on your So one. exactly. So on your chicken and egg problem, nothing will work unless the transformation, any transformation, can be broken up into pieces and steps. And there can be a down payment on the transformation. And then the, 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 the moderation of the effects on economic inequality and economic insecurity can be achieved in the short term and not just in the long term, but combined with some dynamic going in the direction of structural change. What can't happen and what obviously won't work, as you imply in your argument about the chicken and egg problem, is for there to be a structural change, the equalizing consequences of which will be seen only far in the future. That obviously won't work. So this is this is a, a, a contrast that exists at many different levels. This contrast between the humanizing and the transformative. At the very tangible level, as in the example I gave of industrial policy, but all the way up the ladder of, of abstraction to a fundamental contrast between the objective. So on the, on, the, uh, on the view that was established in the late 20th century, the objective is to humanize society. On the other view, which I attributed to the 19th century and want to see resurrected, the objective is the divinization of humanity, not the humanization of society. And the... the the humanization is, is subsidiary to that larger goal. So then it's the claim that the fundamental impulse of the contemporary progressives is pietistic rather than transformative. Now, this then brings us to the third point of departure. And the third point of departure has to do with the substance of the programmatic argument. The first was the, the method, or the practice of thought and of transformation. The second is the normative ideal, the direction, and the, and the consequent understanding of what distinguishes right from left. And the third has to do with the content of the project. So, Right now in the world, and for the last many decades, at least since the end of the Second World War, uh, 
uh, in the rich North Atlantic world, the dominant institutional and ideological settlement has been what we sometimes describe as social democracy or social liberalism, known in the United States as the New Deal, Roosevelt's New Deal. And the, the forces that attempted to reshape the arrangements of power and production retreated from that attempt after the two great wars of the 20th century. And the state, in exchange, as it were, for that retreat, was allowed to acquire the power to regulate the economy more intensively, to attenuate inequalities generated in the market by retrospective tax and transfer, and to manage the, counter, the economy countercyclically through fiscal and monetary policy, Keynesianism. So this settlement is characterized by its institutional conservatism. It didn't reinvent democracy, and it didn't reinvent the market order. So for example, a technical legal e example of, this, of the nature of this, there's a new body of public law created in the middle of the 20th century. But this new body of public law of the regulatory and redistributive state was superimposed on the largely untransformed body of private law, uh, contract and property law, so that the, the, this, at, at the limit, this is what we call market fundamentalism, that the market economy has a single natural and necessary form. So a decentralized economy is a huge instrument for the creation of wealth, but what should its form be? Now, I could just make a break here for a minute to reflect on the legal aspect of this. The, the single greatest achievement of legal theory in the 150 years from the middle of the 19th century to the end of the 20th century was to establish indisputably that the market order has no single natural and necessary form. You start with the abstractions about decentralized property and freedom of contract, and you begin to translate them down into more and more concrete arrangements for the organization of the economy. At each point down, the ladder of greater concreteness and detail, you have choices to make. And it's impossible to resolve these choices by inference from the abstract conception of the market. They turn on conflicts of vision and of interest. That's what the jurists discover in the United States, jurists like Oliver Wendell Holmes. But nevertheless, this analytical achievement of legal theory has never fully penetrated the inner sanctum of economic thinking. The practical economist continues to believe that property is property, contract is contract, and the market is the market, as if they had a predetermined legal architect. The jurist knows that none of that is true, uh, and that there's no natural form. So this settlement of the mid-20th century was based on falling back from any attempt to change the institutional arrangement. And then humanizing, to use the general word, uh, within this structure making it operate more efficiently, diminishing its inequities marginally through retrospective tax and transfer. That's the default position of the progressives, at least in the rich North Atlantic world, even today. Institutionally conservative social democracy 
continues to be the default position of the progressive. <coughs> so for example, and I think I'm not being too unfair, only mildly unfair, if I say that the characteristic ideal of a progressive American politician today is that he would like the United States to become more like the Sweden of the 1970s. That means this this, this settlement. But none of the fundamental problems of the contemporary societies can be resolved or even addressed or understood within the limits of this settlement. So let me give you an example of three large problems that lie beyond the limits of this settlement of institutionally conservative social democracy or social liberalism. So first, I mentioned a moment ago, the hierarchical segmentation of the economy. So there's this huge division between the advanced and the backward parts of the production system. And the division on all the empirical evidence seems to be growing. The rise of productivity is concentrated in the, in the productive vanguard. So the most salient, the most straightforward explanation for the slowdown in the growth of productivity in the American and European economies is that the new productive vanguardism is cabined in these exclusive fringes. So the most productive practice is denied to the vast majority of workers and firms. How could there not be slowdown? Now, that of course is not the general view. The general view is the view that some, the more common view is the view that somehow the contemporary technologies are less potent than the technological innovations of 100 years ago. So attempt to naturalize this slowdown in, in the growth of productivity. So if the chasm between the advance and backward is increasing in the production system, it will be harder and harder to attenuate the consequences through retrospective correction by progressive taxation and redistributing social spending. The social spending has a, uh, an enormous importance, but not as a device of equality, as the means to invest in people and in their capabilities. That was the greatest historical achievement of European social democracy. It's not a solution to the problem of inequality but it does represent this commitment to invest in people and in their capabilities. It would be necessary to have a project to overcome these extreme hierarchical divisions in the production system. And a large part of that project today would necessarily be the attempt to deepen and disseminate the new vanguard of production, the knowledge economy. Now, you can look around you and you can see that for the most part, this project doesn't exist. It's not just that it doesn't exist as a political endeavor. It doesn't exist as an idea. Uh, and if it doesn't exist as an idea, how could it possibly come to exist in practice? Now, now I'll give you an example of a second problem, which has to do with the practical basis of social cohesion. So take the <coughs> most egalitarian European social democracies, like the Scandinavian social democracies. At least until recently, if the world could vote 
it would not vote to become the United States. It would vote to become Sweden. But not the real Sweden, this imaginary Sweden of the triumph of social democracy. Now, in those social democracies, the, the basis of social solidarity was money transfers organized by the state against the background of a very high level of ethnic and cultural homogeneity. So many of these European nations were like big tribes. Cohesion based on sameness, the same people, the same nation, the same genealogy. Now, for recent decades, there are increasing migratory flows that erode the level of social and cultural homogeneity. The result is to expose the insufficiency of money, of money transfers as a social cement. Money is not enough to establish a practical basis of cohesion. The ethnic homogeneity degrades. What will replace it? What, will re what would have to replace it would be a whole range of ways of people doing things together. That's how they reestablish social union. And assuming responsibility to help take care of one another beyond the boundaries of family selfishness. And money, the money transfers, could only be a, an extension, a subsidiary form of social cohesion. That, once again, involves institutional change beyond the limits of this social liberal or social democratic settlement of the last century. Now let me give you a third example of a structural problem that would require structural solutions and that for that reason lies beyond the boundaries of this institutional and ideological settlement of the last century. We, it came up before in our conversation in this very class, the relation of change to crisis. So all the democracies that exist in the world now, you could consider weak democracies. They're weak democracies in the sense that They continue to make change depend on crisis. And they are based on a relatively low level of organized popular political engagement in political life. For the most part, the people, the sovereign people, are asleep. Except when there's a crisis and then they wake up. Now, in the history of Europe in the 20th century, the most important form of crisis was war. In war, they woke up. And then when peace was reestablished, they went back to sleep and drowned their sorrows in consumption. That's been the basic rhythm. So what we would want as Democrats and experimentalists is that the dependence of change on crisis be diminished. But then we need another kind of democracy which would be a high energy democracy, adopting a set of innovations that elevate the level of organized popular engagement in political life, preserve the liberal principle of fragmentation of power, but repudiate the conservative principle of the slowing down of politics. And that too lies entirely beyond the limits of this social democratic or social liberal compromise of the past century. So notice that each of those alternatives are the three problems that I described, the problem of hierarchical segmentation of the economy, the problem of the practical basis of social solidarity, and the problem of the organization of democratic politics insofar as it shapes the dependence of change on crisis. 
or all of those problems demand structural change, but not necessarily or not at all this fantasy of sudden systemic change. The structural change, to be real, will be piecemeal. That's the only way to, in which it can exist, in fact. Now, so that's then what I want to take here in the course as the substantive point of departure. What lies beyond institutionally conservative social liberalism and social democracy? Taking as the provocation, as the pressure, the existence of these structural problems that require structural solutions beyond the, beyond the limits of that settlement of the mid 20th century. And right there, then we have these three points of departure. The methodological point of departure, the way to think programmatically, the, the normative point of departure, the ideal, and the, uh, and the substantive point of departure, the confrontation with the limits of the institutionally conservative social democracy or social liberalism. That's the effort. So we have, we have a few more minutes, and let's, let's discuss then this third point of departure of the, the social democratic or social liberal settlement. I'm saying it's the default position. And even in the rest of the world, it remains the default position. Because basically what we have in the rest of the world by way of progressive politics is what's sometimes called state capitalism, authoritarian or not, and then an attempt to imitate first world compensatory social democracy or social liberalism. That's the political agenda of humanity today. And there's, there's no hope in that. There's, it's, it's not. Uh, it's, it's not an acceptable point of departure. That's the, that's the circumstance that requires this kind of initiative. So you see this idea of the, of the default position and why it's insufficient. So what's really happened in the evolution of social democracy is it's retreated in, it, in its European home ground. So you could say, speaking very broadly, that social democracy was defined by three sets of arrangements. First, by distinctions between insiders and outsiders, especially in the labor market. So there was, in each social democratic country, there were workers who had quasi-tenure in their jobs, the insiders, with a whole set of protections. But then there was always a second part of the labor market, the first world counterpart to the informal economy in the vast developing countries. Those were the outsiders. And the distinction between the insiders and the outsiders was, came to be regarded as both too costly, imposing costly economic liberties, and unjust, sacrificing the interests of the unorganized to the interests of the organized, the, the, of the unorganized to the quasi-tenured part of the labor force. Then the second set of arrangements was that the orchestration of deals between big business and big labor or by national governments. This was sometimes called income policies or social compacts. And the third part of the arrangements was a high level of redistributive social entitlements, paradoxically financed 
by the regressive and indirect taxation of consumption, especially through the comprehensive flat rate value added tax or an equivalent to it in all the major European countries. So what's actually happened to social democracy is that it's been, quote, liberalized, meaning that it's given up the first two sets of arrangements and retreated to the last line of defense, which is this high level of social entitlements funded by the regressive and indirect taxation of consumption. And the problem is that this, that neither the original nor the shrunken versions of social democracy have proved capable of addressing structural problems such as the three problems that I cited. The consequences of the hierarchical segmentation of the economy, the practical basis of social cohesion, and the dependence of change on crisis. That's then what demands an effort to, to redefine the direction. That's the argument. That's the argument that, that we need to have about the content of that direction. And in the plan of the course around three main themes, the reorganization of the market order, the reorganization of democratic politics, and the formation of the individual, of the agent, especially through education, who is capable not just of operating capably, ably within the context, but of challenging the context of going beyond it. So would someone like to say something about this third point of departure and, and the conception of it? So I think uh, what has sometimes happened in the United States is that The achievement of European social democracy seems still so far ahead of some of the achievements of the American progressives. You can say, well, how could you ask for even more? Uh, but that's a circumstance, because uh, the, 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 the alternative, the needed alternatives cannot be established by somehow imitating the, the European social democracy of the late 20th century. Because that social democracy has been hollowed out and has proved unable to address these structural problems. So it's not as if the United States could solve its problems by trying to become the Sweden of the 1970s. So, uh, that's how at least provisionally and at the beginning, I wanted to find the goal of the, of the programmatic effort. And I think it is a, uh, <coughs> it's a fantastic task. Uh, and uh, we're in this paradoxical situation in the world. On the one hand, there's a dictatorship of no alternatives. There's despondency, disbelief in the possibility of alternatives. But on the other hand, the world is restless in searching for alternatives. And any plausible, fragmentary progress in this direction, if represented under the lens of a doctrine, could resonate sensationally in the whole world. So it's a, uh, it, it's, it's a magical moment, which has the properties of a so-called chaotic system, stagnant on the surface, but susceptible to sudden reversal. And now comes the role of ideas. <laughs>
because ideas by themselves can't change the world, but without ideas, nothing can change. We have to have a conception of the direction, of the steps. So that's the project, and I look forward to it immensely. Uh, I want you to resist me, to uh, engage. Uh, I know that it's very hard to talk about these things. It's very hard for anyone, anywhere. But uh, make the greatest effort. Uh, Jonathan, you are going to discuss with uh, undergraduates the section, right? You'll be in touch with them. Great. Thank you. Where are you from? Somewhat, because of course they, but it's different. It's very different because the economy is only part of our discussion here, and there it's the whole discussion. Uh, and there, I'm not in a position in that course to defend 